The Iliad, Chapter 6 The battle was left to rage on the level expanse between Troy's two rivers. Bronze spearheads drove past each other as the Greek and Trojan armies spread like a hemorrhage across the plain. Telamonian Ajax, the Achaean Wall, was the first Greek to break the Trojan line and give his comrades some daylight. He killed Thrace's best, Achamus, son of Eusaurus, smashing through the horn of his plumed helmet with his spear and driving through until the bronze tip pierced the forehead's bone. Achamus's eyes went dark. Diomedes followed up by killing Axylus, Teuthras's son, a most hospitable man. His comfortable home was on the road to Arisbe, and he entertained all the travelers, but not one came by to meet the enemy before him and save him from death. Diomedes killed not only Axylus, but Calesius, his driver, two men who would now be covered by earth. Then Euryalus killed Opheltius and Dresus, and went on after Asepus and Pedasus, twins whom the naiad Abarbaria bore to Buculion, Laomedon's eldest, though bastard son. He was with his sheep when he made love to the nymph. She conceived and bore him the twins whom Euryalus now undid. He left their bright bodies naked. Then Polypoetes killed Astyalus, Odysseus got Pydides with his spear, and Teucer took out Eretaeon, a good man. Nestor's son Antilochus killed Ablerus, the warlord Agamemnon killed Elatus, who lived in steep Pedasus on the Satnaoesis. Laetus killed Phylasus as he fled, and Eurypylus unmanned Melanthius. But Menelaus took Adrastus alive. Adrastus's terrified horses became entangled in a tamarisk as they galloped across the plain, and, breaking the pole near the car's rim, bolted toward the city with the others. Their master rolled from the car by the wheel and fell face first into the dust. Menelaus came up to him with his long shadowed spear, and Adrastus clasped his knees and prayed. Take me alive, son of Atreus, and accept a worthy ransom from the treasure stored in my father's palace. Bronze, gold, wrought iron, my father would lavish it all on you if he heard I was still alive among the Achaean ships. The speech had its intended effect. Menelaus was about to hand him over to be led back to the ships, but Agamemnon came running over to call him on it. Going soft, Menelaus, what does this man mean to you? Have the Trojans ever shown you any hospitality? Hospitality, that is. Not one of them escapes sheer death at our hands, not even the boy who is still in his mother's womb. Every Trojan dies, unmourned and unmarked. And so the hero changed his brother's mind by reminding him of the ways of conduct and fate. Menelaus shoved Adrastus aside, and Agamemnon stabbed him in the flank. He fell backward, and the son of Atreus braced his heel on his chest and pulled out the spear. Then Nestor shouted and called to the Greeks, Soldiers of Greece, no lagging behind to strip off armor from the enemy corpses, to see who comes back to the ships with the most. Now we kill men. You will have plenty of time later to despoil the Trojan dead on the plain. Nestor's speech worked them up to a frenzy, and the Trojans would have been beaten back to Ilion by superior force had not Helenus, Priam's son and Troy's prophet, approached Aeneas and Hector. Aeneas and Hector, the Trojans and Lycians are counting on you. You two are the leaders in every initiative and council and in battle, so take a stand here. Go through the ranks and keep our men back from the gates before they run through them and fall into their women's arms, making our enemies laugh. 
Once you have bolstered our troops' morale, we will stand our ground and fight the Danans. Tired as we are, we have our backs to the wall. Hector, go into the city and find our mother. Tell her to take a company of old women to the temple of Athena on the Acropolis, with the largest and loveliest robe in her house, the one that is dearest of all to her, and place it in the knees of braided Athena, and promise twelve heifers to her in her temple, unblemished yearlings, if she will pity the town of Troy, its wives and its children, and if she will keep from holy Ilion, wild Diomedes, who is raging with his spear. I think he's the strongest of all the Achaeans. We never even feared Achilles like this, and they say he is half divine. But this man won't stop at anything. No one can match him. Hector took his brother's advice. He jumped down from his chariot with his gear and toward the ranks, a spear in each hand. He urged them on, and with a trembling roar, the Trojans turned to face the Achaeans. The Greeks pulled back. It looked to them as if some god had come from the starry sky to help the Trojans. It had been a sudden rally. Hector shouted and called to the Trojans. Soldiers of Troy and illustrious allies, remember to fight like the men that you are, while I go to the city and ask the elders who sit in council and our wives to pray to the gods and promise bulls by the hundred. And Hector left, helmet collecting light above the black hide shield, whose rim tapped his ankles and neck with each step he took. Then Glaucus, son of Hippolochus, met Diomedes in no man's land. Both were eager to fight. But first, Tydeus's son made his voice heard above the battled noise. And which mortal hero are you? I've never seen you out here before on the fields of glory. And now here you are ahead of everyone, ready to face my spear. Pretty bold. I feel sorry for your parents, of course. You may be an immortal, down from heaven, far be it from me to fight an immortal god. Not even mighty Lycurgus lived long after he tangled with the immortals, driving the nurses of Dionysus down over the mountain of Nysa, and making them drop their wands as he beat them with an axe goad. Dionysus was terrified and plunged into the sea, where Thetis received him into her bosom, trembling with fear at the humans' threats. Then the gods, who live easy, grew angry with Lycurgus, and the son of Cronus made him go blind, and he did not live long, hated as he was by the immortal gods. No, I wouldn't want to fight an immortal, but if you are human and shed blood, step right up for a quick end to your life. And Glaucus, Hippolochus's son. Great son of Tedius, why ask about my lineage? Human generations are like leaves in their seasons. The wind blows them to the ground, but the tree sprouts new ones when spring comes again. Men, too, their generations come and go. But if you really do want to hear my story, you're welcome to listen. Many men know it. Aphira, in the heart of Argive horse country, was home to Sisyphus, the, the shrewdest man alive. Sisyphus, son of Aeolius, he had a son, Glaucus, who was the father of faultless Bellerophon, a man of grace and courage by gift of the gods. But Proetus, whom Zeus had made king of Argos, came to hate Bellerophon and drove him out. It happened this way. Proetus's wife, the beautiful Antea, was madly in love with Bellerophon and wanted to have him in her bed. But she couldn't persuade him, not at all, because he was so virtuous and wise. So she made up lies and spoke to the king, either die yourself, Proetus, or kill Bellerophon. He wanted to sleep with me against my will. The king was furious when he heard her say this. He did not kill him. He had scruples about that, but he sent him to Lycia with a folding tablet, on which he had scratched many evil signs, and told him to give it to, to Antea's father to get him killed. So off he went to Lycia with an immortal escort, and when he reached the river Xanthus, the king there welcomed him and honored him with entertainment. For nine solid days, killing an ox each day, but when the tenth dawn spread her rosy light, he questioned him and asked to see the tokens he brought from Proetus, his daughter's husband, 
and when he saw the evil tokens from Proetus, he ordered him first to kill the Chimera, a raging de monster, divine, inhuman, a lion in the front, a serpent in the rear, in the middle a goat, and breathing fire. Bellerophon killed her, trusting signs from the gods. Next he had to fight the glorious Salimai, the hardest battle, he said, he ever fought. And third, the Amazons, women the peers of men. As he journeyed back, the king wove another while. He chose the best men in all wide Lycia, and laid an ambush. Not one returned home. Blameless Bellerophon killed them all. When the king realized his guest had divine blood, he kept him there and gave him his daughter, and half of all his royal honor. Moreover, the Lycians cut out for him a superb tract of land, plowland and orchard. His wife, the princess, bore him three children, Isander, Hippolochus, and Laodimea. Zeus, in his wisdom, slept with Laodimea, and she bore him the godlike warrior Sarpedon. But even Bellerophon lost the gods' favor, and went wandering alone over the Aelian plain. His son Isander was slain by Ares, as he fought against the glorious Solimai, and his daughter was killed by Artemis of the Golden Reigns. But Hippolochus bore me, and I am proud he is my father. He sent me to Troy with strict instructions, to be the best ever, better than all the rest, and not to bring shame on the race of my fathers, the noblest men in Ephyra and Lycia. This, I am proud to say, is my lineage. Diomedes grinned when he heard all this. He planted his spear in the bounteous earth and spoke gently to the Lycian prince. We have old ties of hospitality. My grandfather Oeneus long ago entertained Bellerophon in his halls for twenty days, and they gave each other gifts of friendship. Oeneus gave a belt bright with scarlet, and Bellerophon a golden cup, which I left at home. I don't remember my father Tydeus, since I was very small when he left for Thebes in the war that killed so many Achaeans. But that makes me your friend, and you my guest if you ever come to Argos, as you are my friend, and I your guest whenever I travel to Lycia. So we can't cross spears with each other, even in the thick of battle. There are enough Trojans and allies for me to kill, whomever a god gives me and I can run down myself and enough Greeks for you to kill as you can. And let's exchange armor, so everyone will know that we are friends from our father's days. With this said, they vaulted from their chariots, clasped hands, and pledged their friendship. But Zeus took away Glaucus's good sense, for he exchanged his golden armor for bronze, the worth of one hundred oxen for nine. When Hector reached the oak tree by the western gate, Trojan wives and daughters ran up to him, asking about their children, their brothers, their kinsmen, their husbands. He told them all, each woman in turn, to pray to the gods. Sorrow clung to their heads like mist. Then he came to Priam's palace, a beautiful building made of polished stone with a central courtyard flanked by porticos, upon which opened fifty adjoining rooms, where Priam's sons slept with their wives. Across the court, a suite of twelve more bedrooms housed his modest daughters and their husbands. It was here that Hector's mother met him, a gracious woman with Laodice, her mo most beautiful daughter, in tow. Hecuba took his hand in hers and said, Hector, my love, why have you left the war and come here? Are those abominable Greeks wearing you down in the fighting outside? And does your heart lead you to our Acropolis to stretch your hands upwards to Zeus? But stay here while I get you some honey-sweet wine, so you can pour a libation to Father Zeus first and the other immortals. Then enjoy some yourself, if you will, drink. Wine greatly bolsters a weary man's spirits, and you are weary from defending your kinsmen. Sh sunlight shimmered on great Hector's helmet. Mother, don't offer me any wine. It would drain the power out of my limbs. I have too much reverence to pour a libation with unwashed hands to Zeus Almighty, or to pray to Cronion in the black cloud banks, spattered with blood in the filth of battle. 
but you must go to the war goddess's temple to make sacrifice with a band of old women. Choose the largest and loveliest robe in the house, the one that is dearest of all to you, and place it on the knees of braided Athena, and promise twelve heifers to her in her temple, unblemished yearlings, if she will pity the town of Troy, its wives, and its children, and if she will keep from holy Ilion wild Diomedes, who's raging with his spear. Go then to the temple of Athena, the war goddess, and I will go over to summon Paris, if he will listen to what I have to say. I wish the earth would gape open beneath him. Olympian Zeus has bred him as a curse to Troy, to Priam, and all Priam's children. If I could see him dead and gone to Hades, I think my heart might be eased of its sorrow. Thus Hector, Hecuba, went to the great hall and called to her handmaidens, and they gathered together the city's old women. She went herself to a fragrant storeroom which held her robes, the exquisite work of Sidonian women, whom godlike Paris brought from Phoenicia when he sailed the sea. On the voyage he made for high-born Helen. Hecuba chose the robe that lay at the bottom, the most beautiful of all, woven of starlight, and bore it away as a gift for Athena. A stream of old women followed behind. They came to the temple of Pallas Athena on the city's high rock, and the doors were opened by fair-cheeked Theano, daughter of Sisius, and wife of Antenor, breaker of horses. The Trojans had made her Athena's priestess. With ritual cries, they all lifted their hands to Pallas Athena. Theano took the robe and laid it on the knees of the rich-haired goddess, then prayed in supplication to Zeus's daughter. Lady Athena, who defends our city, brightest of goddesses, hear our prayer. Break now the spear of Diomedes, and grant that he fall before the western gate, that we may now offer twelve heifers in this temple, unblemished yearlings, only do thou pity, the town of Troy, its wives, and its children. But Pallas Athena denied her prayer. While they prayed to great Zeus's daughter, Hector came to Paris's beautiful house, which he had built himself with the aid of the best craftsmen in all wide Troy. Sleeping quarters, a hall, and a central courtyard near to Priam's and Hector's on the city's high rock. Hector entered, Zeus's light upon him, a spear sixteen feet long cradled in his hand, the bronze point gleaming, and the ferule gold. He found Paris in the bedroom, busy with his weapons, fondling his curved bow, his fine shield, and breastplate. Helen of Argos sat with her household women, directing their exquisite handicraft. Hector meant to shame Paris and provoke him. This is a fine time to be nursing your anger, you idiot! We're dying out there defending the walls. It's because of you the city is in this hellish war. If you saw someone else holding back from combat, you'd pick a fight with him yourself. Now get up, before the whole city goes up in flames. And Paris, handsome as a god. That's no more than just, Hector. But listen now to what I have to say. I, it's not out of anger or spite towards the Trojans I've been here in my room. I only wanted to recover from my pain. My wife was just now encouraging me to get up and fight, and that seems the better thing to do. Victory takes turns with men. Wait for me while I put on my armor, or go on ahead. I'm pretty sure I'll catch up with you. To which Hector said nothing, but Helen said to him softly, Brother-in-law of a scheming, cold-blooded bitch. I wish that on the day my mother bore me, a windstorm had swept me away to a mountain, or into the waves of the restless sea, swept me away before all this could happen. But since the gods have ordained these evils, why couldn't I be the wife of a better man, one sensitive, at least, to repeated reproaches? Paris has never had an ounce of good sense, and never will. He'll pay for it some day. But come inside and sit down on this chair, dear brother-in-law. 
You bear such a burden for my wanton ways, and Paris' wiltlessness. Zeus has placed this evil fate on us, so that in time to come the poets will sing of us. And Hector, in his burnished helmet. Don't ask me to silt, sit, Helen, even though you love me. You will never persuade me. My heart is out there with our fighting men. They already feel my absence from battle. Just get Paris moving, and have him hurry so he can catch up with me while I'm still inside this city. I'm going to my house now, to see my family, my wife and my boy. I don't know whether I'll ever be back to see them again, or if the gods will destroy me at the hands of the Greeks. And Hector turned and left. He came to his house, but did not find white-armed Andromache there. She had taken the child and a robed attendant, and stood on the tower, lamenting and weeping, his blameless wife. When Hector didn't find her inside, he paused on his way out and called to the servants. Can any of you women tell me exactly where Andromache went, where she left, and when she left the house? To one of my sisters, or one of my brother's wives? Or to the temple of Athena, along with the other Trojan women, to beseech the dread goddess? The spry old housekeeper answered him, Hector, if you want the exact truth, she didn't go to any of your sisters, or any of your brother's wives, or to the temple of Athena, along with the other Trojan women, to beseech the dread goddess. She went to Ilion's great tower, because she heard the Trojans were pressed, and the Greeks were strong. She ran off to the wall like a madwoman, and the nurse went with her, carrying the child. Thus the housekeeper, but Hector was gone, retracing his steps through the stone and tile streets of the great city until he came to the western gate. He was passing through it out onto the plain when his wife came running up to meet him, his beautiful wife Andromache, a gracious woman, daughter of great Aeteon. Aeteon, who lived in the forests of Placos and ruled the Cilicians from Thebes under Placos, his daughter was wed to bronze-helmeted Hector. She came up to him now, and the nurse with her, held to her bosom their baby boy, Hector's beloved son, beautiful as starlight, whom Hector had called Scamandrius, but everyone else called Astyanax, lord of the city, for Hector alone could save Ilion now. He looked at his son and smiled in silence, and Dramica stood close to him, shedding tears, clinging to his arm as she spoke these words. Possessed is what you are, Hector. Your courage is going to kill you, and you have no feeling left for your little boy or for me, the luckless woman who will soon be your widow. It won't be long before the whole Greek army swarms and kills you, and when they do, it will be better for me to sink into the earth. When I lose you, Hector, there will be nothing left, no one to turn to, only pain. My father and mother are dead. Achilles killed my father when he destroyed our city, Thebes with its high gates. But had too much respect to despoil his body, he burned it instead with all his armor and heaped up a barrow. And the spirit women came down from the mountain, daughters of the storm god, and planted elm trees around it. I had seven brothers once in that great house. All seven went down to Hades on a single day, cut down by Achilles in one blinding sprint, through their shambling cattle and silver sheep. Mother, who was queen in the forests of Placos, he took back as prisoners with all her possessions, then released her for a fortune and ransom. She died in our house, shot by Artemis's arrows. Hector, you are my father. You are my mother. You are my brother and my blossoming husband. But show some pity and stay here by the tower. Don't make your child an orphan, your wife a widow. Station your men here by the fig tree, where the city is weakest because the wall can be scaled. Three times their elite have tried an attack here, rallying around Ajax or glorious Idomeneus or Atreus' sons or mighty Diomedes. Whether someone in on the prophecy told them, or they are driven here by something in their heart. And great Hector, helmet shining, answered her, 
Yes, Andromaca. I worry about all this myself. But my shame before the Trojans and their wives, with their long robes trailing, would be too terrible if I hung back from battle like a coward. And my heart won't let me. I have learned to be one of the best, to fight in Troy's first ranks, defending my father's honor and my own. Deep in my heart I know too well, there will come a day when Holy Ilion will perish, and Priam and all the people under Priam's ash spear, but the pain I will feel for the Trojans then, for Hecuba herself, and for Priam king, for my many fine brothers who will have by then fallen in the dust behind enemy lines. All that pain is nothing to what I will feel for you, when some bronze-armored Greek leads you away in tears on your first day of slavery, and you will work some other woman's loom in Argos, or carry water from a Spartan spring, all against your will, under great duress, and someone seeing you crying will say, That is the wife of Hector, the best of all the Trojans when they fought around Ilion. Some day someone will say that, renewing your pain at having lost such a man to fight off the day of your enslavement. But may I be dead and the earth heaped up above me before I hear your cry as you are dragged away. With these words, resplendent Hector reached for his child, who shrank back screaming into his nurse's bosom, terrified of his father's bronze-encased face and the horsehair plume he saw nodding from the helmet's crest. This forced a laugh from his mo father and mother, and Hector removed the helmet from his head and set it on the ground, all shimmering with light. Then he kissed his dear son and swung him up gently and said a prayer to Zeus and the other immortals. Zeus and all gods, grant that this my son become as I am foremost among Trojans, brave and strong, and ruling Ilion with might, and may men say he is far better than his father when he returns from war, bearing bloody spoils, having killed his man, and may his mother rejoice. And he put his son in the arms of his wife, and she enfolded him in her fragrant bosom, laughing through her tears. Hector pitied her and stroked her with his hand and said to her, You worry too much about me, Andromaca. No one is going to send me to Hades before my time, and no man has ever escaped his fate, rich or poor, coward or hero, once born into this world. Go back to the house now and take care of your work, the loom and the shuttle, and tell the servants to get on with their jobs. War is the work of men, of all the Trojan men, and mine especially. With these words, Hector picked up his plumed helmet, and his wife went back home, turning around often, her cheeks flowered with tears. When she came to the house of manslaying Hector, she found a throng of servants inside, and raised among these women the ritual lament, and so they mourned for Hector in his house, although he was still alive. For they did not think he would ever again come back from the war, or escape the murderous hands of the Greeks. Paris, meanwhile, did not dally long in the high halls. He put on his magnificent bronze inlaid gear, and sprinted with assurance out through the city. Picture a horse that has fed on barley in his stall, breaking his halter and galloping across the plain, making for his accustomed swim in the river. A glorious animal, head held high, mane streaming like wind on his shoulders. Sure of his splendor, he prances by the horse runs and the mares in pasture. That was how Paris, son of Priam, came down from the high rock of Pergamum, gleaming like amber and laughing in his armor, and his feet were fast. He caught up quickly with Hector, just as he turned from the spot where he'd talked with his wife and called out, Well, dear brother, have I delayed you too much? Am I not here in time, just as you asked? Hector turned, his helmet flashing light. I don't understand you, Paris. No one could slight your work in battle. You're a strong fighter, but you slack off. You don't have the will. 
It breaks my heart to hear what the Trojans say about you. It's on your account they have all this trouble. Come on, let's go. We can settle this later. If Zeus ever allows us to, us to offer in our halls the wine bowl of freedom to the gods above, after we drive these bronze-kneed Greeks from Troy. <laughs>